Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Jesus Welcome to Jesus 911 on Virgin's Most Powerful Radio. My partner, Jess Romero, he's not in today. He's in Baltimore at the uh, USCCB conference with other members of the lady across the nation as a show of force to let our bishops know that we want some action. So uh, I have a stand-in partner today. Her name is uh, Detective Terry Johnson. She works for a large metropolitan agency. We'll see you tomorrow. This is Jesse Romero, Jesus 911. My partner, Eddie's out doing some apostolic work, and uh, so I'm a one-man car. I'm a king car. Jesus 911, from Monday through Friday, is three retired L.A. cops uh, who love the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, were committed Catholics, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and, uh, we're in, uh, and we love Holy Mother the Church. And we try to do shows on spiritual warfare and also on what we call muscular Christianity, Issues that build up a man's faith. Today I want to talk about what is an exorcism. Okay, There's two extremes to avoid when we talk about the topic of an exorcism. And by the way, it's, it's just mentioned in the catechism, the term exorcism. If, if you want a, a definition, it's in paragraph 1673 of the catechism, where it says, When the church asks publicly and authoritatively, authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ, that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawed from his dominion, it is called exorcism. Jesus performed many exorcisms, and from him the church has received the power and office of exorcising. Paragraph 1673 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. When it comes to exorcisms, there is, according to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, we got to avoid two extremes. Number one, we got to we we have to avoid perceiving the presence of the devil in everything, and maintaining a borderline paranoia with regards to the reality of the demonic. The second thing we have to avoid is we have to avoid ignoring or or denying altogether the reality of Satan and of the demons and the reality of spiritual warfare that every Christian faces to some degree every single day. For instance, quite often in parishes where in the level of catechesis is very minimal, and often in third world cultures, people can be found who live lives of great fear regarding the presence of the devil, living in constant fear of his attacks on their families and lives. Likewise, quite often amongst the Western cultures, the various university settings where people you know, consider themselves more sophisticated and more erudite, again, frequently amongst uh, Catholic universities, and even among Catholic clergy worldwide. The reality of uh, the demonic is, is altogether denied and perceived as foolish, outdated, or simply naive. It just reminds me of the of the top Jesuit, Father Arturo Sosa, who uh, was on record denying the reality of Satan. Can you believe that? And uh, thanks be to God, Pope Francis had to correct him, had to give him a correction. As I talk, continue talking about this, I just want to mention that I had a great weekend at Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was at the Rekindle the, the Fire Men's Conference. I want to thank uh, Bishop Rhodes for allowing me to be out there. And, and I want to just give a shout-out to the Rekindle the Fire Men's Conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 1,500 men showed up. There was 1,500 seats. They were all full. There was guys standing around the convention. Uh, it was... Uh, it, their numbers keep on picking up. I think this is the 10th annual Rekindle the Fire Men's Conference. And I think they started off with like five or 600 people. They're up to 1,500 people. So they're incrementally growing every year. You know why? Because they bring in Orthodox Catholic speakers. That's why. And guys are hungry for the truth. Let's go back to my topic. On July 16, 2009, Cardinal Norberto Rivera, the Cardinal Archbishop of Mexico City, he gave a talk to the Exorcist of Mexico and he made note of these two extremes to avoid. He accentuated the fact that we must never fall into the trap of denying the existence of Satan. Here's what he said, okay? And uh, he said, The existence of the devil must be taken as a fact without exaggerating or minimizing his actions out of skepticism 
or credulity taken to the extreme. Skepticism leads many to deny the existence of the devil and dismiss his actions as psychological, sociocultural, or paranormal phenomena. Others out of extreme gullibility see the devil everywhere and grant him supernatural powers as if he were God, which is another error. There's been a hard battle against the powers of darkness which began at the origins of the world and will endure until the last day of planet Earth according to the, what the Lord Jesus Christ said. So that's a balanced view of the diabolical. And even back in 1979, under Pope Paul VI, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, they put out this statement on the reality of the devil. They said, quote, People are asking whether there should not be a revision of doctrine on this point regarding Satan. Some critics believing that they can define Jesus' own position claim that none of his words guarantees demonic reality. The existence of demonic reality, they say, no longer has a call on our faith today and that we're free to reject it. For, for still others, the idea of Satan, whatever its origin may have been, has lost its importance. If we were to continue to insist on it, our teaching would lose all credibility. For all the above, finally, the names of Satan and of the devil are only mythical or functional personifications the significance of which is solely to undermine the dramatic fashion, the hold which evil and sin have on mankind. So, the CDF back in 1975 goes on to accentuate that such an understanding and, and foolhardy denial of the reality of, this, of satanic activity places a Catholic outside the realm of authentic Catholic doctrine and the teachings of the early church fathers and of the councils. Both of these extremes lead us away from God, the revealed teachings and the doctrine of the church, and the grace is made available to us via the sacraments and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Satan hates the mother of God, and Satan flees her presence. And it's for this reason that the saints and the church have often suggested to us to make a consecration to Mary each day or at least once a year. If you haven't consecrated yourself to Mary, here's the basic consecration prayer. And this protects you from the diabolical because the devil fears, demons fear the Blessed Virgin Mary. Repeat after me in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I say this prayer every morning. Repeat after me. My queen, my mother, I give myself entirely to you and show my devotion to you. I consecrate to you this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my whole being without reserve. Wherefore, most loving mothers, I am your own. Keep me, defend me as your property and possession. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a daily consecration prayer to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Demons fear her. So put yourself in the mantle of her protection every single day. If you follow the directives of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Fatima and St. Pope John Paul II, along with the world's bishops and the Orthodox churches, that... Uh, Consecration uh, to the Blessed Mother is extremely important. Pope John Paul II consecrated the world to the Blessed Mother on the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25, 1984. And Pope Pius XII had previously consecrated the world to the Blessed Mother on October 31st, uh, Halloween Day, by the way, for the secularists, in 1942. And regarding the pivotal, pivotal role of Mary in the battle against Satan, Cardinal Rivera from Mexico, he says this, quote, Mary brings us to Jesus. She protects us and cares for us in this difficult ministry. Mary also participates in exorcisms. She herself is an exorcist and expels the devil through her sanctity. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Mary herself is an exorcist and expels the devil through her sanctity. This is by Cardinal Norberto Rivera from Mexico. It's important to point out that, that an exorcism itself is, is not a sacrament, but rather a sacramental, which leads us to the sacraments. Sacramentals, like an exorcism, they themselves do not confer the grace of the Holy Spirit in the way that the sacraments do, but sacramental, like an exorcism, prepare us to receive grace and dispose us to cooperate with it. An example of other sacramentals that we as Catholics should be using all the time, 
these are basically our 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 um this is our battle gear. Examples of sacramentals are rosaries, crucifixes, statues, holy water, and scapulars. And the most important and powerful of the sacramentals are blessings, home blessings, blessings of articles and food and people. Blessings are sacred because they consecrate the person and the articles to God. Did you catch that? That's why it's important to bless your meals when you go out and eat in public. Because you don't know the person who prepared your, your meal cursed your food. And this is how a lot of people get diabolically afflicted, eating in public places and eating food that's been cursed by the cooks. Don't think every single cook out there in every single uh, you know restaurant and eating place is a solid, hardcore Catholic Christian. Okay, Most of them are pagans. You know, when a chalice is blessed for a newly ordained priest or the consecration of a new altar for a church, that's so powerful because the blessed article or item should always be respected and given proper treatment. Now, we have to admit that there's been an influence of Hollywood and the entertainment media. It's greatly deteriorated the level of proper catechesis amongst the faithful with regards to the church's teachings regarding the devil, the demons, and exorcism. And such negativity that comes from the mainstream liberal media has in no way altered or harmed the ongoing teachings of the Catholic Church with regard to these matters. On the contrary, quite often when the Catholic Church has been attacked from external or internal forces, she's always responded by clarifying her doctrine more coherently. And for almost you know, 2,000 years, 21 ecumenical councils of the Church, with the exception of, of Vatican II, uh, were councils addressed heresy, schism, external forces, and even aggressive political forces. And we therefore have the expression that a council is often convoked when it is provoked. And the teachings of the Catholic Church with regards to demonology and exorcisms are no exception. And and thanks be to God. I hear the I hear the music. Jesus 911. Talking about what is an exorcism, giving you exactly what the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith says. The Pope's this is Jesse Romero, one man car, my partner Eddie's doing some apostolic work. Shout out to the Rekindle the Men's Conference over in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We'll be back. We'll be right back. Don't change that dial. Hello, this is Terry Barber with the Terry and Jesse Show. I'm here with Gil Holoretti. He is the president of the Catholic Men's Fellowship of California. Gil, we got a men's conference coming up. I appreciate you having me on, Terry, to share about our Rise Up, O Men of God, the Church for You Does Wait Super Saturday Conference, and it's Saturday, March 28th in Covina at Sacred Heart Catholic Church, 344 West Workman Street in Covina, California. Who are the speakers? We have some great speakers lined up. We have Steve Ruda, former captain of the L.A. Fire Department. He's dynamic. Mm -hmm. He's energetic. He will really keep the conference moving. We have Monsignor Tim Nichols, the pastor from St. John Vianney. He's he's dynamic. Mark McElrath, Father Darren Merlino, a trained exorcist. Charlie Eshelman, a past Navy SEAL. We have Deacon Omar Uriati, who is from our parish, St. Louis de Marillac, and Father Joseph Shea. And I'll be there myself, giving a little plug for Virgin Most Powerful. You can reach us at catholicmen.org. Tickets are on sale there. Just follow the link. Tickets are on sale at eventbrite.com. Just be sure to get your tickets now till the 31st for $35 and $45 after that till the day of the conference. Sign up for this men's conference. Call Gil at 626-841-9090. I'll be sure to answer your call and give you all the information you need for the Rise Up, O Men of God, for you, the Church Does Wait Conference. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate your help. God bless you. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee... 
they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, one-man car. On uh, this program, you have three retired L.A. cops that are in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and faithful to Holy Mother Church, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary, giving you giving you some good Catholic information. We call that intel or, de- or briefing in police work. And we just want to give you the nuts and bolts of the Catholic faith to just empower you and just to give you the tools so that you can go out and answer that call to holiness because that's exactly what every single Catholic is called to. We are called to holiness. By the way, there's breaking news. Weinstein was, uh, Harvey Weinstein was found guilty. It says jury finds the former titan of Tinseltown guilty of sex assault. Fallen producer could face decades in prison. Harvey Weinstein found guilty on two counts. These women broke their silence to testify against the disgraced Hollywood producer. So, uh, again, uh, sin and its consequences. You know, you could get away with sin for a while, but uh, eventually God is going to ask you to render an account of your sin in this life and the next. <laughs> now, Harvey Weinstein may spend the rest of his life in prison as a as a broken, emotionally broken old man. Hopefully somebody reaches him in prison and gives him the life-saving Catholic gospel so that one day he can be out of that prison and die and get to heaven one day and be forgiven of all sins through the purgatorial fires and be saved. So hopefully... Uh, For the next couple of decades, as he sits languishing in prison, hopefully somebody reaches them with the Catholic gospel, which is the fullness of truth. I'm talking about what is an exorcism. There's a document that, if all of you want to go deeper into this, it was put out in 1975. It's, uh, it's, it's, It's called The Christian Faith and Demonology. It was put out by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And it's, it's, it's brought a much clearer focus of church doctrine by Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI. Okay? Here's another, another paragraph from that document, this, uh, this Vatican document called uh, In Christian Faith and Demonology. It says, Satan, whom Jesus had confronted in, by his exorcisms, whom he had encountered in the desert and in his passion, cannot be the product of the human faculty of inventing fables and personifying ideas, nor can he be an erroneous relic of a primitive culture. In other words, the church is saying this stuff is real, it's not fake. Pope Paul VI himself took direct aim at the cultural and theological dangers of denying the reality of Satan. He basically answered the modernists back in 1972. He said this, quote, There is this terrible, mysterious, and frightening reality of evil, And he who refuses to recognize the devil's existence departs from the integrity of biblical and ecclesiastical teaching. Neither exegetes nor theologians can neglect this caution. Close quote, Pope Paul VI. And let's go back to the very first Pope, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. St. Peter exhorts the faithful of the Catholic Church to stay alert and to be vigilant against the attacks of the devil. Here's what the first Pope says, quote, be sober. And vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in faith. Look at verse 9. When people say, Oh, the devil made me do it. I can't. Get out of here. Okay? That's not what the church teaches. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, that we can resist the devil. How? By doing push ups, pull ups? No. Steadfast in faith. By your Catholic faith. Okay? As soon as you start feeling those attacks, those mental attacks, start going into prayer mode, okay? When you start going into prayer mode, which is the Holy Rosary, and you don't remember anything, the Angelus, the Chaplain of the Divine Mercy, start calling upon the name of Jesus or Mary. What happens? That means that you're able to, when you start praying, you you take custody of your intellect, 
And that's how you can resist this demonic thought tampering or this demonic projection, okay? Jesus himself addressed Peter with these very words in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew 26, verse 40 to 41, our blessed Lord said to Peter, quote, he, so he said to Peter, so you could not keep watch with me for one hour. Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The word of the Lord. This readiness that our Lord speaks of and, and this sobriety, which is addressed by the apostle Peter, brings us back to the old adage, know thyself. We should strive to be aware of our own weaknesses while simultaneously trusting the divine mercy of our Lord. And we should seek constantly the grace of the sacraments and the teachings of the faith and stay focused on the blessed sacrament and the blessed Virgin Mary as our compass and our guide. That's the way we live a sober and a vigilant life. Okay? I just told you. How do you live a sober and a vigilant life? Trust in the divine mercy of Jesus. Seek the grace of the sacraments often. Know the teachings of the church and follow them. Stay focused on the blessed sacrament and, and, and stay focused on the blessed Virgin Mary as our compass and guide to heaven. That's how you stay sober and vigilant against the devil. So who can be an exorcist? According to canon law, 1172, no one can legitimately perform exorcisms over the possessed unless he's obtained special permission from the local ordinary, which is the bishop. And the Code of Canon Law goes on to point out that, quote, such permission from the, from the bishop is to be granted only to a presbyter, a priest, endowed with piety, knowledge, prudence, and integrity of life. So the bishop makes sure he picks out a priest that's uh, basically somebody who's who stands out amongst his brother priests, to be honest with you. Only a priest with proper experience and holiness and knowledge of theology should undertake to perform an exorcism. There have been many instances when the demon being possessed has publicly acknowledged the sins of the priest or the individual attempting the exorcism in full view of those that are present, especially if you're in mortal sin. And more than this, though, is the desire of the church to heal the person of the demoniac affliction. There are many instances of those who become possessed or oppressed by way of their own fault, which is usually the case, such as involvement in satanic cults or rituals or Ouija boards, necromancy, tarot cards, New Age activities. It is sometimes the case wherein the person himself is in no way responsible for demonic presence. An example would be parents who offer up their children in satanic cults or satanic rituals. That happens. While this is to a certain degree rare within the U.S., satanic worship is growing at an alarming rate in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And it's interesting that quite often Roman Catholic clerics are the first to scoff at the possibility of the existence of the devil and demonic activity. But uh, in, in, in the book, it's called The Right by Matt Baglio. He says, quote, While not necessarily rejecting the official teachings of the church, most clergymen after Vatican II found the concept of the devil a, a slideshow that no serious-minded priest would lose time considering. The devil has finally convinced the world that he no longer exists, close quote. While many clerics and theologians within the U.S. and Europe would find the issue of demons amusing or superstitious, or they simply ignore it altogether, in most Christian cultures worldwide, it's simply an assumption that they do spiritual warfare with demonic powers following the injunction by St. Paul himself in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 12, where St. Paul says, quote, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we're not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places, close quote. Let's talk a little bit about the rite of exorcism. In the last line 
And by the way, if you want to call up and ask me any questions on spiritual warfare, Catholic style, give me a call. 888-526-2151, 888-526-2151. Your calls are always, always welcome. 888-526-2151. So, in the last line of the Our Father, we pray and deliver us from evil. And during the Mass, the priest follows up this prayer by saying, Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. That comes right from the Roman Missal. In praying the Our Father, do you realize that we're acknowledging both the fundamental existence of evil forces, though in no way equal to those of of, of good and our own fallen nature, which inclines us towards sin as well? It's called concupiscence. But when we talk about evil in the Roman Missal, the Our Father, who are we referring to? We're referring to the devil. We're referring to Satan. Up until 1972, all clerics received the minor orders prior to their ordination to the priesthood. One of the orders was called the Rite of Tonsure and the Rite of Exorcist. But following the directives of the Second Vatican Council and the revision of the liturgical rites, in 1972, Pope Paul VI suppressed the rites of tonsure, that, that's the cutting and shaving of, of, of part of one's hair, signifying the entrance into the clerical state, and the exorcist. At this point, the actual entrance into the clerical state began with the ordination to the diaconate, transitional or permanent. Referring to this, Pope Paul VI notes in his, in his uh, motu proprio ad pacendum. He says, since entrance into the clerical state is deferred until the diaconate, there no longer exists the right, the, the right of first tonsure by which a layman used to become a cleric. But a new right is introduced, termed candidacy, by which one who aspires to ordination as a deacon or priest publicly manifests his will to offer himself to God and the church so that he may exercise a sacred order. And during the pontificate of Pope Paul VI and nearly all of the liturgical rites that were updated and revised though always maintaining the same primary structure as tradition held, the last of these rites to be updated following the Second Vatican Council was the rite of exorcism in January 26, 1998. My name is Jesse Romero, One Man Car. We're talking about what is an exorcism, and I'm going to go into the next uh, segment about when the rite of exorcism was changed and why was it changed. You don't want to miss this. This is all good Catholic intel. Don't turn that dial. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum Liturgies, featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Karstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today for Adoramus at the Triduum. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, one-man car. They call it a king car. My name is Jesse Romero. I do this program Monday through Friday with uh, Ruben Nava, retired sergeant from the L.A. Sheriff's Department. Uh, Eddie Chavez, retired sergeant from the California Highway Patrol. Three Catholics that are in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful to Holy Mother Church, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary, militantly orthodox, and we do a Monday to Friday show to raise people's awareness of spiritual warfare of the diabolical, and especially about the power and the lordship of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the powerful intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as regards to spiritual warfare. And we also talk on issues that raise the faith of Catholic men, what we call muscular Christianity, where we challenge men to answer the call to holiness. I'm talking today about what is an exorcism, and I'm giving all the nuances of an exorcism. All the the what, where, when, hi, who, and when, and, and everything that you do in a police report. So the the right of exorcism was revised by the Catholic Church for the first time in 1614. Okay, That was uh, the first time it was ever revised. And, and in 1998, there's been the Second Vatican Council, post-Vatican II, they've revised the rite of exorcism again in 1998. It's, it's, it's now an 84-page new rite. It's very similar to the old rite of exorcism with a few minor changes, though some would argue this point, some exorcists would say that the old rite is much more powerful than the new rite. And... Uh, Pope Benedict has given exorcists the the freedom to use the old right if they want to. And most exorcists that I know, they in fact do use the old right. They say it's much more powerful. They say it's like an AR-15 compared to the new right, which is like a, uh, you know, like a, like a Glock or like a 22 rifle. So the exorcist in addressing the demonic spirit, reading from the old right, it says this. This is from the old right. It says, quote, I command you unclean spirit. Now, it should be noted that other Christian communities such as Anglicanism, Lutheranism, Methodism, Pentecostalism, they all have certain prayers that they often refer to as as prayers of exorcism. And while these prayers may in fact be prayers which are helpful to the afflicted individual and may be minor prayers of deliverance, listen to what I'm saying. And by the way, if you want to call up, go ahead, ask any question. Spiritual warfare time. 888-526-2151, 888-526-2151, 888 Let me say this. Only a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox priest has the spiritual power to exercise a true demonic presence. Why? Because only the Catholic and the Orthodox churches maintain apostolic succession, and so only the Catholic and the Orthodox have valid holy orders entrusted to St. Peter and the Apostles by Jesus Christ himself. And so, outside of the, commu- up, if outside of, of, of the communion with, with the Catholic Church, uh, the Protestants, Methodists, Lutherans, they could do, you know, deliverance prayers or minor exorcism prayers, but they don't have the full authority as has been given uh, by Jesus Christ to the Apostles. And that order, that apostolic uh, authority extends also to the Orthodox churches because they do have valid orders, valid apostolic orders. Now, if you remember the story in the book of Acts, there were some Jewish rabbis that uh, attempted to exercise demons, and they were attacked by the demons because even the demons recognized their lack of spiritual authority. Now, the Jews used to have the office of exorcism. It started with at the time of David and Solomon, and Jews had exorcists. 
I know one of the things I was looking at, uh, I read a Jewish encyclopedia on their exorcisms. Their most powerful prayer was Psalm 91. That's an exorcism prayer, which is still used by the Catholic Church, by the way. And they would walk around the possessed person, and it's like 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 the possessed person, you know, is is in the middle, and they'd walk around, you know, walk around and around like a merry-go-round, and they would be singing in Hebrew Psalm 91, and they would be singing in Hebrew other chants uh, from the from the from the Hebrew scriptures that were powerful to drive out the diabolical. But now that the New Testament has come, and and now has the Old Testament is obsolete. And so now in the New Testament, a, a Jewish exorcist, I would maintain that they've lost their power of exorcism because now the fullness comes through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And there's an example of that. In Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 17, you have some Jewish exorcist that they're saying, wow, the apostles are driving out demons in the name of Jesus. So they said, okay, well, let's, let's us, we're exorcists, we're Jewish exorcists, let's try to call upon the name of Jesus to drive out a demon from a possessed person as well. So here's the way the story goes, quote, Acts 19, 13 to 17. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you. The word adjure means rebuke, okay? Okay, or which means that to repudiate. I adjure you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom this evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was extolled. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Very powerful story. You don't play with this stuff. It's very dangerous, by the way, to try to act like a Catholic priest. It's very dangerous for somebody to go from one Catholic to go to another Catholic. Come over here. Let me drive off the, an evil spirit from you. And... uh and, and, and start uh, doing prayers of exorcism over another lay Catholic. Father Sebastian White, he's the, he's the editor of Magnificat. He had an article a few months ago. He said, it is a very dangerous thing to act like a priest. He was speaking to lay Catholics. It is a very dangerous thing to act like a priest and lay hands on somebody else's head and drive out a demon. Why? Because you don't have the authority and demons know it. And demons will attack somebody that, that they know doesn't have the authority to drive out a demon. Now, a mom and a dad, they have authority over their sons and daughters. Mom and dad, a, a father has an authority over his wife to pray, bless his wife, and to drive out an evil spirit. And a wife has the authority also to bless her husband and also to pray a deliverance prayer to drive out an evil spirit as well. Because both husband and wife, remember this, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, they have rights over each other's body. Remember that, 1 Corinthians 7? A husband has rights over a wife's body. A wife has rights over her husband's body. Therefore, a husband can bless a wife. A wife can bless a husband. A husband can drive out an evil spirit from a wife. A wife can drive out an evil spirit from a husband. However, the only difference would be the husband will, will say, because he's a priest of the house, I bless you. Honey, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, where the wife would say, may the Lord bless, because the wife's not the priest. Though the wife does have authority over his body, but she's not a priest, so she would say, may the Lord bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The husband can put his hand on his wife's head. The wife should put her hand on her husband's shoulder. Why? Again, putting your hand on somebody's head is a sign of priestly authority, and only the husband has that in the house. Now, Husbands and wives, moms and dads can put their hands on the heads of their children based on the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. You have authority. You have authority po based on positive law over your children. So you can put your hand on your children's heads, mom and dad, and say, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Lord, protect them from any evil spirits. Amen. Okay? In 1985, let me go back to a little bit of church teaching here. Back in 1985, 
Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, he reiterated the fact that only authorized exorcists may lawfully and legitimately perform exorcisms. He said this in paragraph 2. He said of a, of a document that he wrote back in 1985, he said, It follows, therefore, that no member of the Christian faithful can use the formula of exorcism against Satan and fallen angels, and even less are able to use the entire text for exorcism. Bishops are to bring this to the attention of the faithful as it is deemed necessary. Now, within the old rite, I think this will be very insightful, an exorcist is still permitted to use the old rite if he wishes to do so. I know Father Chad Ripperger, Father Fortea, Father Gabriel Morth, many exorcists, the professors that, in this field, they still use the old rite. They say it's more powerful than the new rite. So an exorcist is still permitted to use the old rite, the 1614 rite, versus the 1998 uh, edition. But some guidelines are clearly laid out for him prior to exercising the afflicted person. Number one, the priest should not rely on his own abilities, but that of God. Number two, the priest should strive to grow in knowledge of the faith and the church's theology by way of sound study and prayer. Number three, the priest should not be too quick to believe that a person is indeed possessed by the devil or demons. He should consult medical experts first and get the legitimate insights of other professionals. Number four, a priest should make note of each exorcism in an attempt to learn from each in order to gain knowledge and experience. Five, a priest should make note of the tricks used by the devil in an effort to discourage the exorcist or make him believe that the demon is not present, often they will remain silent until commanded to speak or reveal their names. Six, a priest, he should remind the one to be exercised that the demon will often go to great lengths to dissuade the individual from proceeding ahead with the exorcism because an exorcist cannot perform an exorcism without the individual's total permission. Because uh, if he doesn't, this ends the ritual. He just won't do it. Number seven, a priest should remind the afflicted individual that recourse to sorcerers, necromancers, summoning the dead, seances, Ouija boards, tarot cards, palm readers, the new age, all that stuff is forbidden and it's sinful in the eyes of God and it will only intensify the demonic presence within the person. In fact, this is how the person probably got in trouble in the first place. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm talking about what is an exorcism. I'm going right from the documents of the church. Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI. I'm giving you nothing but the nuts and bolts, the meat and potatoes of what is an exorcism. We'll continue. Stick around. Don't turn that dial. What is an exorcism from the lips of the Catholic Church herself? We finally did it. We have a Catholic Mental Health Conference on April 25th, 2020, here at the Sacred Heart Chapel with Dr. Louis Sandoval. He's going to be speaking on the basics of mental illness versus what we consider normal. Number one, he's going to go on the basics of mental illness versus what we consider normal. Second hour, depression, anxiety versus oppression and obsession. The third hour, bipolar disorders. Oh my gosh, infestation and possession. He's going to talk on mental health with the spiritual aspect. Number four, talk will be on drug use, altered mental status versus demonic influence. I want to hear that talk. I hope you do too. Go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call us at 877-526-2151. The date is April 25th, 2020. Be there by calling 877-526-2151. God bless you. Leviticus 11.44 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. St. Vincent Pilati said, You must be holy in the way God asks you to be holy. God does not ask you to be a Trappist monk or a hermit. He wants you to sanctify the world and your everyday life. May God show us the path to holiness and help us to follow it all the days of our life.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911. You know why we call the show Jesus 911? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is the ultimate first responder. Beyond cops, beyond the military, beyond paramedics, beyond firefighters, Jesus is the ultimate first responder. And without Jesus responding to our plea, it, we're, we're hell-bound. Every single one of us, the wages of sin are death. Every single one of us without Jesus are, is going to hell. And that's why I call the show Jesus 911, not just because three retired cops are doing the show, because that should be the plea from your heart every single day. Jesus, help me! In other words... Help me from myself. Help me from my own concupiscence, my own disordered appetites. And also in this show, we want to build up your faith. I want to give you good Catholic information so you're a strong Catholic because I want you to become a holy Catholic, and I want you to go to heaven. I want to get to heaven myself. So I figure if I'm out there throwing the lifeline to people, the Lord is going to have mercy on me. I'm talking about what is an exorcism from the actual documents of the Catholic Church. And I know this is a topic that fascinates people. This is, this is the topic that fascinates people. I'm telling you right now. You say the word exorcism, everybody's ears perk up like Lassie in the Catholic Church. Everybody's. I get it. Because this is part of the deposit of faith, and it's not talked about very often. I'm giving you right here, uh, I'm giving you 17 points that, uh, f- that a, a priest must know when he permits, when he performs the rite of exorcism, specifically the old rite of exorcism. So I'm giving you 17 bullets. Bullet number eight. A priest needs to recall the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus says in Matthew 17, 20, that this type of demon can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. All the exorcists I know, they have a serious life of fasting. They, a lot of them live like a monastic life. And so the exorcist should be vigilant in preparing himself and the person through his own prayer and fasting. you got to get the person that's possessed, that's going to go through sessions, you got to get him involved in prayer and fasting as well to prepare them for the rite of prayer by fasting and by frequent reception of the sacraments. And uh, I think i got a caller. Rich, uh, do i got somebody on the line? And by frequent You're on. Go ahead. Yes, hi, Jesse. Hi. Um, hi. I was calling because I have a question to ask you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my gra- I, have a, I have an adopted grandson, and um, he recently told me that uh, he met this girl, and uh, she's nice and everything. And the only thing is she said that she likes to uh, do uh, voodoo. Whoa. Um, I told him that... He knew her very well. He said he knew the family. He had known them for a while already, but he didn't know that she was into that. So I was wondering. I told him about. Okay, hold on. Voodoo's part of the occult. This is this is a diabolical uh, system of of uh, of communicating with evil spirits, which comes from South America. I forget exactly what country, but this is forbidden by the Catholic Church. And uh, in the strongest terms, go ahead. Yeah, and and she's um, she's uh, Mexican. She's Mexicana. Okay. Well, a lot. Uh, unfortunately, they... a lot of a lot of Mexicanas. You know, I'm, I'm Mexican American, so I'm saying this uh, yeah. <laughs> from personal knowledge. Just don't know their faith very well, and as a result of that, they fall into a lot of occult practices and get themselves in trouble. But go ahead. Mm-hmm. Does he need to stay away from her? I would say he would because. I don't. I don't like the idea that uh, he's been talking with her, and he's been watching your show with me at times when he's here with me, so he knows what you've been saying, you and, and you know, and and, um, and Eddie and all them. So he, that's why he came and told me. 
Okay. Here's what I would say. This is your, your grandson, right? And that's yeah. good. I'm glad yeah. that you're a good grandma. You're letting him listen to the show. This is, I think every Catholic teenager should be listening to my show. Not because it's so good. It's because I'm talking about things that they need to know about. And this is not talked about in, you know, Sunday homilies, generally speaking. Um, if, unless your, your grandson is, is a solid Catholic where he can evangelize her, uh, where he can bring her to Christ. If that's what he's trying to do, bring this person to know Jesus and the, and the church and the life of prayer and the sacraments, then he should continue that relationship. But that relationship would be based on one on evangelization, not one of curiosity. Mm-hmm. If he's going to be have a relationship with this girl out of curiosity, like, so what is voodoo? I never heard about that. That's dangerous. That could get him in trouble. And especially in voodoo, they start doing what's called incantations or hexes and curses. And so who knows? Uh, if, if your grandson's in, his li- in her life, and let's say she starts falling in love with your grandson, and your grandson doesn't reciprocate that, that, that infatuation right back, she could start cursing him and hexing him. And uh, if your yeah. grandson is not in a state of grace, if he's in mortal sin, and it's, not e- it's, mm-hmm. not, it's, it's easy to fall in mortal sin when you're a young person. If he's in right. mortal sin, those curses become effective and could affect him. And especially, mm-hmm. Lord forbid, but if, if they start having a fornicating relationship, which is common, right. Uh, because once they start fornicating, if this person's into voodoo, now you have another problem. You're, it's called, not only are you in mortal sin because of fornication, but it's even worse because it's with somebody who's a part of the occult. Now you have what's called a soul tie. A soul tie. So there could be demonic transference. If this woman, which without a doubt, there has to be some type of diabolical activity within her. If she's into voodoo, she's already invited the demonic into her body and she, into her life. By having a fornicating ex- uh, uh, relationships with your grandson, I hope that's not happening, but you're, you, you get demonic transference or what's called soul ties, and now your son can be, your grandson can be even uh, mm-hmm. affected at a higher level. Mm-hmm. Where's, where's the mom and dad yeah. of your grandson right now? Where, are they in the picture anywhere? Um, no, my grandson, well, he's not here. Um, he's my adopted grandson. Okay. Um, my son adopted him as a, he was already nine or 10 years old when he got adopted. He's 21 now. The mother never baptized him. That needs to happen. Absolutely. The father, yeah, the father has, has uh, really nothing to do with him. Um, so we're trying to, you know, install all of this in him, you know, as the years go by. But I think that's the reason why he came and told me about her, because he knows already how we feel about all this. And, and, and also, like I said, he's been watching your program with me. When Praise God. Here. He knows enough. You know, even though he's not baptized, the Holy Spirit through natural law has revealed that this is wrong in his heart. But we, we need to get him baptized as soon as possible and get him through an, a good RCIA program because baptism mm-hmm. is a minor exorcism. A baptism mm-hmm. is going to protect him from, from diabolical attack, especially if he's having a relationship mm-hmm. with, a, with a girl that's involved in voodoo. Yeah. We got to get him have, baptized as soon as possible, mm-hmm. and we got to yeah. get him in a good in a parish through an RCIA program so, he, so his, yeah. his mind becomes formed with, with the Word of God, and he starts mm-hmm. entering into a life of prayer, and that takes custody of his intellect from diabolical attacks. Right, right. Start praying for him every night, know. Grandma. I want you to start yeah, praying for him every night. Okay, I want you to go, yes, I and I want I want you to I want you to let, put your get a blessed object. I know you got blessed objects in your house, right? Yes, I do. Okay, get a blessed object, like a blessed crucifix or something. Put it on his shoulder or on his neck, and every night say, "I bless you, grandson, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit." And Lord God, protect him from any evil spirits. Amen. I want you to do that every night. Put a blessed object on his shoulder or on his neck. And I want you to say, I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Lord God, drive away any evil spirits from him. Amen. Do that every single night. That He's going to stay protected by your prayers because the Bible says the prayers of a righteous person has much power. And grandparents do have uh, power in their prayer over their grands, grandkids, not as much as the parents, but, but nonetheless, because they're part of your family line, you still have power over them uh, based, on, based on natural law. 
So start blessing them every night and telling them, uh, grandson, I need to get you to baptize and into an RCIA program. This is the, yeah. this is the most important mm-hmm. thing that we can do for you as grandparents. Yes, and the thing is, he does want to get baptized. Um, I tried calling the church, but the church said I couldn't do anything. It's because he's already 21, and I have not. I can't do anything for him. He has to go willing. Right, right. So walk him over there. Say, yeah. Come on, let's go. Let's go to the rectory. You're going to yeah. sign up for RCA. I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. Yeah, and, and I told him, I said, we'll all go. All, all my family, we'll all go. You know, Absolutely. Kind of, yeah. And one of you, uh, one of you, sit in the classes with them, just accompany them. It's actually good for somebody to sit in the classes. You know why? Because yeah, then that person wants, goes. Yeah, that person. You're going to go through the Catholic faith yourself. And say, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. It's going to be good for you as well. So right. you know, whoever's going to sponsor them into the church, sit in the classes with them to show that you guys are interested in in what he's learning as well, and it's going to just strengthen what you already know. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, and you know what? Bless you. Uh, go, go on uh-huh. the Internet and get Father Ripperger's prayers. They're called Auxilium Christianorum. They're on the Internet. You can mm-hmm. put them on your iPhone. Auxilium Christianorum. And start mm-hmm. praying those prayers every night. Those are evening oh, prayers I to pray bind them. evil. Yeah. It's, yeah, I pray it's, them every day. <laughs> okay, you pray them every day? Every day. Good. Don't stop. Okay, th- those are binding prayers that should be prayed in the evening and they pr- keep your family and your household protected from the diabolical. As a matter of fact, your, your grandson's not baptized. The fact that he hasn't fallen into voodoo, and he's actually told you about it, and he's curious about listening to this show, you know why? Because of those prayers you're praying. You're the one that's keeping the, the, the attacks from the diabolical from, t- from taking full effect on him through your prayers and your faith and your holiness. So keep it up, Grandma, because this is a fight for his soul. Yeah. All right, okay. I will. I will. All right. All right. God Thank bless you. you. God bless you too. You're listening to Jesus nine one one. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm talking about what is an exorcism. I think you got. Uh, that's pretty much a wrap. Up next, you're going to listen. Be listening to Gary Machuda. Gary Machuda is probably one of the the best apologists, the greatest apologist in the Catholic Church. He's uh he's an encyclopedia of information. All the books that he's written on apologetics are pure gold. Uh, and he does his uh, program from uh, the command center over in uh, over in, in the state of over in the Midwest, the Midwest command center, as he calls it. And he calls this program hands on apologetics, hands on. That's that's like martial arts. That's like jujitsu. He puts his hands on you with the word of God and with some good intellectual thought. Uh, my name is Jesse Romero. My partner, Eddie's doing out some apostolic work. And, and uh, Ruben, I'll be back with Ruben tomorrow. Jesus 911 is a show where we're trying to give Catholics good information on spiritual warfare from a Catholic point of view, not from Hollywood, not from Protestantism, but from the one true religion, the Catholic Church. And so that's what we seek to do. Shout out to all the guys, Fort Wayne, Indiana Men's Conference, Rekindle the Fire. Thank you for inviting me once again. God bless you. Keep the faith. And uh, up next, don't turn that dial. Stick around. Hands on apologetics. Say Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. prayer for priests O my Jesus I beg thee on behalf of the whole church grant it love and the light of thy spirit and give power to the words of priests so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee O Lord Lord give us holy priests thou thyself maintain them in holiness O divine and great high priest may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares which are continually being set for the souls of priests may the power of thy mercy O Lord shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests for thou canst do all things amen virgin most powerful pray for us Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity.